Well, um, Matthias, I say we go and uh, we will do the best we can. So I'm going to hand it directly over to you and uh, let you do the full Monty welcome. The full Monty welcome. I think we have heard that now a few times, so we can keep it short. <laughs> welcome to day four of uh, this fall meeting, uh, the Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather. The earlier three days were really focused on various aspects of where aviation weather related activities reside throughout the uh, federal government. And today's focus is trying to understand and appreciate what we heard and try to, you know, find synergies and opportunities as to how do we move forward from here? Uh, where are the important issues that we need to focus on and try to make progress. And so who who is actually monitoring the chat room and helping with the discussions? Is is Dave Strand doing that again or are you Matt and Bill Shepard that yourself? How do you envision that to go today? That'll that'll be me today, Matthias. Um I will oh, be monitoring the chat Brian. room. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So Again, please mute your microphones, uh, turn your videos off unless you're uh, speaking and uh, submit your questions and comments in, in the chat room and we will use that as we have in the last three days. And the meeting will be recorded as well. The material will be posted on the FPA website uh, in due course. And without further ado, I'm handing it over to Matt Franzak and Bill Bauman to shepherd us through uh, this day of exciting uh, synergies and opportunities. And I look forward to what we get out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I appreciate your, your introductory words. And um, uh, I'm gonna uh, um, just kind of uh, try to set up the session and then hand it over to Bill who will explain how it's actually going to work. So uh, as Matthias has said, we're, 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 we're attempting to, to basically understand what we have heard over the last several days in, in meaningful ways. And, um, and if possible, we, we are attempting to come up with um, tangible outcomes, I think, is what we are, are listing these in here. Things that we can do, connections that we can make, uh, positions or opinions that can be written and and uh, and passed along to the appropriate uh, to the appropriate folks. Uh, and so, in order to um, represent the broader um, aviation weather. Uh, enterprise, we have put together a uh, a panel of folks who, um, for lack of better term at this point, we are calling uh, representatives of the Aviation Weather Enterprise. Um, and um, they consist of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Branham from the Department of the Air Force, uh, representing the, the, the Department of Defense as a whole. Uh, Randy Bass, uh, uh, representing the FAA, uh, Jeff Weinrich, uh, NOAA National Weather Service, Dave Chorney. Uh, <laughs> actually, it, it says ICAMS there. It would, I think, be more appropriate for me to say uh, the Office of Federal Coordinator of Meteorology transitioning over to IMCO. And then Kevin Johnston, uh, who, um, although is an FAA, employee today will re be representing NASA in the context of the Tuesday session, uh, which was focused around uh, AAM and UAS type uh, weather needs. And, uh, and, and everybody on that panel has already been introduced once, uh, so I won't, um, I won't introduce them again, with the exception of Kevin. Um, and since Kevin is, uh, is pulling extra duty here, and 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 representing Nancy Mendonca and and the, the NASA folks, let let me just say that 
uh, we, we, and this is all, all from memory here now, Kevin. So if I screw any of this up, please correct me. Uh, Kevin uh, is a graduate of Penn State with a degree in meteorology. He spent many years in the United States Air Force as an Air Force weather uh, officer. Uh, when he retired from the Air Force as a lieutenant colonel, uh, he, um, he uh, took a position with the National Weather Service and ultimately ran uh, the aviation, held, this is the part I'm going to mess up badly here, Kevin, the, the aviation weather branch, the aviation, what, what the heck do you call that thing? And you're on mute. Yep. Uh, aviation services branch at the time okay. it grew bigger. It, it, it uh, added space component, uh, but that was after I left. And and there are there's at least one other person on this call who has sat in that chair. Maybe several other people on this call who have sat or are sitting in that chair. Uh, and uh, and then he came over to the FAA and uh, and has has been doing yeoman's work. Uh, for, for many, many years. Currently, he uh, works in the aviation uh, weather division uh, where um, pretty much everybody in the FAA works and works for Bill Bauman because that's the way things go. And the only negative thing I can think of at all to say about uh, Kevin is that for reasons that are completely unclear, he's a Mets fan. But uh, you know what? We all have our crosses there. Another disappointing season. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so um, so what are we trying to do? Again, we're trying to to identify, you know, gaps. We're trying to identify weather duplications, uh, aviation weather duplications of effort that we think may be going on, collaboration opportunities, and tangible outcomes. And and quite frankly. Um, uh, both Bill and I were scratching our heads a little bit as to how to best accomplish this. And this morning in the pre-dawn hours when I was in that kind of fuzzy state between asleep and awake, a notion came to me and I proposed it to Bill and and he is, uh, is on board. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, surprise everybody except for Bill and Brian and, and, and have Bill tell you how we're going to approach this today. Over to you, Bill. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, as Matthias said, for folks to please keep their cameras off and on mute when you're not talking. And I'm going to pick on Laura Wilson and Frank Brody. Looks like both of your cameras are on, even though it looks like Alaska in the middle of the night. Uh, now we see Frank. There we go. Uh, so you just turn your cameras off, I guess, uh, from Matthias's points to save bandwidth. Um, so we, we were kind of struggling, uh, Matt and I, over how to run this day, and we thought we would hear gaps and duplications of effort and things during the previous three days and be able to put that together for everybody. And we were in a bit of a panic mode yesterday when we really couldn't come up with a, a good list or large list of those items. So Matt had a brilliant, let's go Mets. Oh, geez, Gordon. I was going to say let's go Yankees, but you know that's over with for the season. The Red Sox beat them again. Um, but I digress. <laughs> uh, Matt came up with a brilliant, brilliant idea, which is what he's showing here. This is an app called Mural, and uh, we went through it this morning. And really, it's to provide a brainstorming session. And Matt just provided the link in the chat, which he'll do occasionally throughout the day, because we want you all to access that app as a visitor, which is what the link should be there. You don't have to enter your name or email address. It's optional, um, but you can if you want. And you can put into the app a sticky note. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to double click and a yellow sticky note came up. I can change the color of my sticky note. And if you want to, you can name, put your name in there. So later on when we go through here um, in post FPAW, we can see who submitted it. But if you want to be anonymous, that's fine too. And I can put in here a gap that I saw from the other day. Lower atmospheric profiling was something that we discussed. And everybody can feel free to go ahead and um, you just click in the double click in the, the group brainstorm and put in any gap that you would like to discuss. So that's the way we're going to go through this. And everybody 
should be able to see mine. Yep, going back to Teams here, I can see what I entered in uh, my web browser. And we will record those, we'll keep track of them. You can change the size, as I'm not doing. Who's doing that? <laughs> that's, that's me, Bill. That I just you? wanted to make the point that if, if we get a bunch of stickies in here and they're as big as yours, we'll quickly run out of territory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you can change the font size, the color, and what we'll probably end up doing, say we have a bunch of UAS gaps we want to address. Later on, we'll go and, and we'll colorize them and group them together and, and things like that. Um, the other thing that we wanted to emphasize is it doesn't have to be a gap that we necessarily heard discussed over the past three days. So if there's something that the speakers or panels did not address that you all would like us to look into, add that here as well. We're open to anything that may be able to help our aviation community that can be addressed by either FAA or National Weather Service or private industry. Um, feel free to post that as a gap as well. So I think that's all I've got, Matt, unless you've got any other instructions or insight you'd like to add. So, so, uh, so um, as, as you will have noticed by now, when you come in as a visitor, whether you give your name or not, you are given an avatar, and it is an animal avatar. Um, and and that is that is why uh, Bill mentioned if if you are comfortable with putting your name in your sticky note as the originator of the idea, whether it's a gap, a duplication of effort when we get to that state or or whatever, uh, it will be helpful for us if we want to need to go back and perhaps ask more questions. Um, th there are sixty participants in uh, the meeting right now, and you know, if we said to everybody, give us your top five gaps, we could potentially end up with 300 sticky notes in here, which would be a little bit um, over the top from a, a, of a <laughs> attempting to manage perspective. Uh, so uh, I think for the, at least for the starters, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, this is, this is your session. We're going to ask you literally for a gap, the one yep. that just stood out Number to you. One. More, more than anything else, and and um, and 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 we will we will then you know we, we'll we'll give each we'll give ourselves a couple of two three four minutes to put that big gap uh, in in the in the the group workspace, and then we'll call a timeout and and see what we have uh, what we have going on in here, and perhaps how we can categorize or 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 you know. Um, move similar gaps into the same areas of, of the workspace or perhaps even color them the same so that we can uh, you know see what they all look like some of you may not you know be willing uh, able um want to um to uh you know participate in this uh but but you're comfortable leaving an item behind in the microsoft teams chat uh, if that is the case, Brian uh, Pettigrew, our chat uh, monitor, is happy to take your information and transpose it into the collaboration space. And if you if you didn't want to uh, do it by chat, but 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 uh, but you still wanted to provide the input, Brian has even texted uh, or put in the chat his cell phone number where you could text him the information you'd like to have added, and he would be happy to to do that there also. So um, I, I think. I, I think that's all I can think of, Bill. Um, do, do not, folks, do not get hung up by those four gray blocks in the very top. Um, you know, th this this notion came to me this morning at five o'clock. I took a mural template. I kind of redid it a little bit just to uh, to get it into something that that we could work with. Um, those, those show the four areas that we're going to be uh, messing around with today. You can pull notes out of that solo brainstorm area, drop them in the group brainstorm and write in them. You can write in, in the solo brainstorm area, storm area and, then, um, and then drop the finished product down in the group brainstorm. You can zoom in and out as I'm doing right now. You should see it on Teams uh, going in and out. So, uh, for instance, the... the uh, the, the great free and open data sharing, uh, I'm gonna make much smaller now because otherwise we'll not have enough room for all of the other 
uh, all the other notes. And the beautiful thing about Mural is that if we need to uh, zoom in and zoom out to read the um, uh, to, to, to read the information, it's fairly easily done. So I, I can't think of anything else. I'm thinking, Bill, in, in order to to get everybody to uh, to do their thing in a in a in a timely manner, let's maybe set um, I don't know. Um, how many minutes would you like to set? Again, this is your session. I don't want to be taking it over here. Yeah, we'll just give it a couple of minutes. We've got a couple of topics coming up already, so we'll let folks get used to it. And just as a reminder, over the past three days, we've discussed things from uh, UAS to um, range and launch weather. Uh, what other topics have we had? We had uh, ICAMS briefing, so the, the new federal weather enterprise. Uh, we might have questions on that and gaps in how ICAMS is compared to OFCM. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a topic from the past three days. Other gaps for uh, aviation weather, feel free to enter them here and we can discuss them as well. We can have the panel try and answer them and um, we'll make sure we record these um, for the future as well. So um, I am going to Put on my glasses so I can read now that Matt has made some of these boxes smaller. <laughs> and Marilyn, I am not going to follow you as the visiting penguin, but we'll clear that one off unless you have a topic you'd like to add. And um, I'm going to get rid of my own because I don't want to guide this. And the first box that I want to address, and I'm going to start putting up here in, in left to right in some sort of order. Uh, free and open data sharing. So that was certainly, I think, one of the things that we had looked at uh, during the past three days. And um, also, I know from being a member of uh, ICAMS on um, the services committee, that's been something that's been discussed there as well. So um, if one of the panel members would like to um, address that topic or anybody else would like to start discussing it, We'll just open the floor there about the free and open data sharing as a gap. And if you want to put your questions in the chat, I will relay those forward as well. So we're just going to throw it out there and drop the mic. Nobody wants to uh, <laughs> expand on that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've seen the free and open data sharing in multiple forms. One would be government to government. Um, within the government, we can't even use the same operating system. FAA, we use everything Microsoft. NOAA uses everything Google. And even within the government, we have trouble sharing documents. But here we're obviously talking about weather information. So is the topic among government agencies? Is it to include data sharing with private industry? or all of the above. Um, Looks like we got our first questions, Bill, from Tammy starting us off with, how do we encourage private entities to share safety-related data? Anybody want to take a stab at answering that question? So the irony is I, I would think that Tammy's in the catbird seat as far as answering that question. <laughs> I can uh, provide some uh, background on ADSB weather development and the coordination we did regarding putting data out uh, on the uh, open airways. Uh, the uh, We went to A4A and we um, we spoke with the operations uh, committee there, and um, they went out to the weather subcom and uh, and the other uh, subcommittees uh, and polled their members. Um, and uh, nobody expressed a reservation or a concern about putting out the data that is specified for uh, broadcast over a unencrypted anybody who's got the right receiver can receive it and and decode it link and so uh we hear you know a lot that oh airlines aren't going to be willing to share information or uh operators you know are going to hold this uh, close to the vest and, and we do see some evidence of that when uh major investments have been made with uh 
proprietary um, systems and such, but um, but we were really encouraged when the when the ops VP over at uh, A4A came back and said, you know, we've gone out to our members and we haven't uh, we haven't had any reservations expressed by them uh, about ADSB weather. And then when we started coordinating it within ICAO, uh, IATA uh, had a similar question when when we first said we're going to bring this uh, required the set of requirements in for ADSB that'll put uh, weather out over the uh, the unencrypted airways and um, and they went out worldwide to their members and uh, it took about six months but they came back and said none of our members have expressed concern or, or reservation about doing this now the way in which the uh, ADSB weather is specified allows the um, the operators to equip or not equip with it. Uh, obviously, there's been some proposals uh, in the form of uh, Matt and Matthias's paper on ubiquitous ABO, and from the uh, more recently from the NTSB on mandating 121 carriers in the U.S. to equip and, and broadcast uh, uh, ADSB weather data, but uh, but we're, you know, we're seeing uh, encouraging signs uh, on that front, and um, and even, you know, after that NTSB recommendation came out, uh, at least one airline said, you know, that's good because then they can use that as part of their justification to equip uh, going forward. And I think that's that's good on ADSB and you know, objective information from the aircraft. Um, to, in, in my opinion, seems easier to share than those pyreps. And I see, you know, Andy's comment in there about uh, proprietary pyreps should be illegal. And we heard some of that yesterday from Don Ike about um, injuries where one aircraft is following the other and they're not sharing their uh, turbulence information with others. Um, so it, free and open data sharing, I think, is very, very broad where we're talking about, you know, pyreps for one thing but also there's just that weather data um, itself. So if we look at Air Force weather, you know, they've got a uh, cloud computing capability. Uh, FAA is working towards that. National Weather Service has some of that. And are we all sharing data with each other? No, we're not. And also with private industry. So I think there's multiple aspects to the data sharing question and uh, also formats. I do know that ICAMS is working on that. So that's one good part of it. Um, but I think with, with all the other comments coming in now on potential gaps, we'll move on from that. Um, I think the lack of harmonization in situ turbulence reporting kind of follows the open data sharing. Uh, that's part of that and uh, goes back to what Tammy was talking about and um, what Andy was saying. Um, Tammy, I see you have a comment, uh, other data than ADSB. Did you want to expand on that while we're talking about data sharing and turbulence reporting? I, I'm, I'm really just thinking about some, you know, proprietary systems that, you know, some of the airlines may have, you know, instituted within their operations that are just unique to that particular airline um, or any private vendor for that matter. I mean, there's more than just ADSB or ADS weather data out there. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, how do we treat that? How do we how do we do that other than mandating something? Yeah, and, and of course, if private industry is producing data, um, they need to pay for that in some way. So, for example, the lightning networks that are out there, um, everybody has to pay for that lightning data because the government doesn't own it, the government doesn't produce it, and it costs money, so private industry has to make a profit for that. So sharing may not be free, but it could be open, even though somebody might have to pay for that, like we do with NLDN and, and other networks. So um, I think there's multiple aspects to the data sharing. Free is one, open is another uh, topic on there. Um, anybody from the panel want to weigh in before we go to a, a different topic? Hey, Bill, this is Dave Chorney. Hi, Dave. Right, so as you can see, I put in here about ICAMS. I, I think what would be great is at the end of the day, if we can, if, if Paul can make a list of things that um, are shortfalls in the observation world, I can pass this to the 
COBS, which is the Committee on Observations, and then we can distribute that to working groups to work on these shortfalls to see what they can do. And this COBS committee, <clears throat> like I presented in my presentation, will have 15 government agencies involved. So um, it's a good way to get out there and get the agencies talking on how we can share data, at least within the government. And then there's another working group that's non-government data that should be working with non-government agents, uh, non-government entities. So if that's something we can do today uh, or this week after this conference and uh, after 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 actions, I guess, kind of report on the meeting is come up with a list for you guys to give to me so I can present that to them. Yeah, Dave, I think that's an excellent idea, but I'll expand it beyond the committee on observations and we'll present this to all four ICAMS committees to their co-chairs um, and they can to a degree sift through and see what fits their committee because like I said, I'm on the committee on services and I think there's things beyond observations that we could possibly look at there as well. So uh, I, I think we'll expand that and make it available to all of ICAMS if you think that's reasonable, Dave. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. Okay, and, and the other aspect of that, um, those of you who have been here for the past few days heard multiple mentions of the FAA's uh, COI, uh, Community of Interest, where across the FAA organizations, we're sharing information to look at problem statements and then hopefully develop solutions among the different groups within FAA that touch weather. So we can certainly uh, bring this to the COI as well to see if there are things that could be worked on across the agency. Uh, so that gets us within FAA and then ICAMS, as you said, uh, day 15 um, federal agencies that are part of ICAMS. Um, getting into private industry is something else we'll have to think about, but as you mentioned that, that within ICAMS, there is a connection to private industry. So thanks for that, Dave. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Effective so why, why don't you take the pirate process as broken? <laughs> yeah, what are we going to do with no, that? Because I failed to mention on Tuesday when I when I had my 10 minute talk that the the PIREP issue was again a motivator for the, the weather COI, right? Yep, right absolutely. Down. And I guess I'd like to t uh, talk a little bit about it uh, because of what Steve commented on, uh, referenced PIREPs on Tuesday as well. I, I sensed he's very frustrated because he mentioned we got like five different efforts going on in the FAA to improve PIREP dissemination and, and what's it for? You know, is it for the pilot? Is it for the Mets? Uh, you know, improving the forecast. And there were a lot of responses in the chat. You know, hey, it's both used tactically and strategically. And, and you, know, the, you know, it's both for pilots and the forecasters. But I'll tell you what, um, it, you know, it, it's concerning uh, when we're getting down into, you know, a much finer resolution into the AAM world and UAS. And again, we're going to be sitting there saying we need more information. You know, we're talking about getting the drones, uh, weather sensors. So I, I, I guess I'm wondering, do we have a gap? You know, when I say we, the weather community, basically, in understanding and describing the importance of PIREPs uh, to, to, you know, people that I guess really uh you know we need their help in 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 you know doing everything about pirates you know soliciting them uh, disseminating them and and I, I just i just throw that out there to the group i'd like to you know talk that up a little bit yeah and one conversation i can share with you kevin um and obviously the rest of the group here is um Gary Picodner and Randy Bass and I had a discussion with our director and deputy director this morning on the weather technology in the cockpit pirate process and, and proposed work we want to do. And to get at what you're saying, Kevin, they said to us, we need to take more of an enterprise view within the FAA of what we're doing about pirates because there are multiple efforts underway but they don't see the big picture from the enterprise level. What are we doing as an agency to work on the pirate problem. There are multiple things that we're doing and we're trying to do some of that through the community of interest and the special weather action team on, on PIREX. 
but um, there are still multiple efforts underway. And that's not just limited to the FAA, it is across um, the entire community. So how do we get to that? Uh, Gary's hand is raised. Yeah. I guess we'll take I, Gary. The other thing I want to comment, which we talked about, Bill, is that's why I keep saying that word PIREP is antiquated and why I want to expand the sensors and observations. And that's where the UAS SWAT has liked the PIREP idea that we're looking at is because you can get ob tons more observation data like we were talking from people, systems, et cetera, and that starts getting down to the levels that UAS is needing and its observations real time. And then again, and there too, if you get those sorts of observations, I'm assuming the METs can then do more forecasting based on getting these very localized observations. But that's why I think the PIREPs, what we call a PIREP today that's on a form and what it's limited to doesn't support the future. And I think that's what Wittick has learned and why we made that proposal is to ex do away with that word and call it an observation report, human, um, something like that, Observate current observations or timely observations, observation reports, whatever, and get rid of that term, that form that is so limiting and really isn't supporting anybody. I mean, right now it doesn't meet anybody's needs and that's what I was showing in the problem statements and the research we had, as well as the current architecture that I just sent you with the barriers in there, that the architecture itself isn't working. Right. Is there a difference between, like we were saying this morning, the as-is system with PIREPs and the 2B system that takes into account more observations to provide information to pilots? So, um, Andy, I think you had your hand up, and then uh, Marilyn after that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I, I second what Gary is talking about. Uh, obviously, the uh, definition of a PIREP is a little, needs to be redefined, um, and that's overdue. Right now, um, in addition to the UREPs, and um, been talking with Gordy Rother and several others about uh, breaking action reports, um, but you know, we ran into the same definition problem. PIREP itself being a UA, uh, which stands for upper air, right. is not supposed to be a ground report. But anything that comes from a pilot to other people should be in the category of PIREP. You know, it is a pilot report of conditions. Um, but I certainly don't want to exclude uh, UAS or any other form of information that's incoming, you know, for dissemination to others. So, yeah, if we get our hands around that one, we'll probably uh, probably have a little bit easier time with this. Uh, the other problem, though, is uh, having multiple roadmaps right now i can name at least four that are going on within the u uh within the faa right now and i think that's one of the, our challenges is to get our arms around the enterprise within the faa instead of the individual silos that are working on this stuff which is hopefully what the coi is going to lead us to and that's my thought too you know but we have the uh the pirep corrective action plan uh, Bob Avgen was telling me a couple days ago, uh, MITRE delivered the PIREP Modernization Strategic Plan to AJM 33, and, you know, on and on. Uh, yeah, the, the whole idea behind the COI was that we could all play on the same page there. Right, and I think we're learning our way, and, and hopefully we'll get there. Um, Marilyn, I'll turn it over to you. I don't want to get hung up on PIREPs. I don't want to make this a, a PIREP only session, but Marilyn, go ahead if you have something quickly. Um, quickly, yes. Uh, PIREPs, we've been talking about how to disseminate and all of that, but I think if you take a different tact and look at the way pilots are trained, uh, from the time I had my private pilot training to ATP and, and everything along the way, even type ratings, PIREPs, I may have heard about PIREPs two or three times. So I would suggest if you want PIREPs to be accurate and if you want more PIREPs, then we need to educate the pilot community, the instructor community, have them 
uh, integrate that as part of the training, which it is, but test it. When you're testing and you're a designated examin examiner or you're the FAA and you're testing an airman for a rating, test on PIREPS. Have, have as part of the pre-flight planning, do a PIREP, you know, file a PIREP as part of what you're going to do during the flight. Um, I really think that if you look at the cross section of CFIs, they're not training anyone yeah. to do a high rep or understand it. Yeah, so, I've I've proven that out a number of times in uh, public outreach venues where I'll ask, you know, especially at a CFI DPE meeting in Anchorage a couple times, ask the group, you know, how many of you were trained on PIREPs? And maybe four or five hands go up in a room of 50 people. Uh, how many of you train your students to do PIREPs? And two or three hands go up. And how many of the DPEs actually ask for a, you know, a pilot candidate for a, a certificate how many of you actually ask them to perform a PIREP? And it's not in the standards, so no hands go up. But Andrew, as you know, the PIREP problem statements, as well as the barriers that were identified by NTSB, just training doesn't cover the problem statements, nor does it address all the barriers that have been acknowledged by multiple research. So we have seven problem statements in your PIREP SWAT, of which training really doesn't address them. And the barriers that have been identified to why pilots don't submit them, training is only one of a number of ones that training doesn't overcome. And I think, uh, and we've talked about this before, automated PIREPs from ADSB, EDR from turbulence and whatnot, in my opinion, seems like a much better way because I'll tell you, in my 20 years in the military and in the years I worked operations, begging pilots, military pilots for PIREPs and explaining how that helps the people following them in flight and helps our models and helps the forecast. It was like talking to a brick wall. They just didn't submit PIREPs. And these were flights right. across the Atlantic, across the Pacific. These were uh, cargo carrying aircraft. It wasn't like a, a fighter doing low level. They were sitting at cruising altitude doing nothing. So in my opinion, it seems like more automation would help, but I'm gonna get off the pirate topic for now. I know, Tom, you had your hand raised. If you don't mind putting your question into the chat and um, we'll, we'll make sure we secure that and add that to the gap session here. Um, let's see, what else can we pick on here? Weather radar gaps in locations distant from airports to support AAM. So we have a number of UAS uh, options in here. I think those are the orange ones up at the top and um, I, we've talked about that, not just weather radar, but off airport observations. I guess I'll throw that to the panel to start. And, and Kevin, you're representing NASA, who's working AAM. You are the uh, UAS rep for our division. Did you want to address any of the gaps that are discussed there or, or questions? Trying to read them. You need to put your glasses on. <laughs> uh, there you go, look at that. Well, we definitely know that, uh, you know, the resolution that, you know, we have today in our weather information, whether it's an observation or forecast, that, you know, it, it's not at the resolution that, you know, the, the UASs need, right? Whether you're working in an urban environment or, or rural. And so <clears throat> a lot of work is, is ongoing to address that. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the UAS SWAT. Uh, I know NASA is also looking at uh, an MIT Lincoln Lab effort to do follow on from our gap analysis, which is a little dated now and very broad. That was a 2017 effort, but they've got a nine month effort uh, with Lincoln to uh, address the gaps. And, and now uh, with the help of like aircraft uh, certification folks, we're teasing out what I call requirements, right? So thre important thresholds to the UAS and the, and the UAS operation. And I think I mentioned on Tuesday, one that is is interesting to me is uh, rain intensity. Um, now they're gonna, you're gonna have to avoid, operators are gonna have to avoid 
uh, areas with uh, half an inch of rain uh, within an hour. Right. Well, OK, and, and we did some checking on that and the Weather Service, uh, they look at that threshold of a, a half an inch, but over six hours. So what do we got to do? I mean, how, I mean, as a forecaster, I never really looked at that threshold uh, and that timeline. So, you know, again, is this something uh, we got to look into research? Um, but yeah, so we're starting and uh, kind of exciting. And again, it's it's not not a government uh, only effort here. I think we've got to reach out. We've been working with the ASTM folks, uh, giving them uh, these thresholds, uh, looking at standard development. Uh, I know Gordy and John Steventon and AFS are leading that effort up with um, analyzed weather standards. So there's a lot of good things going on. And uh, so we'll be addressing these. Thanks, Kevin. Anybody else want to comment on that? And I'll I'll add to that with the box in the center green there. I think that's a UAS issue, collaborative strategy between NOAA and FAA on the urban modeling. Um, and that goes along with the purple box up to the right, NWP large data distribution and management strategy as models increase. What if we've got models running at 100 meter resolution that we want to use for uh, things like UAM? How do we handle that? And do we do that? Uh, collectively uh, among federal agencies to produce these high resolution models where we let private industry take that on and provide that to their users. Do we let Google run their own model? Um, any comments or thoughts on those? Come on, we must have some modelers out there. Randy, you have your hand raised. <laughs> This is Curtis Selbite. <laughs> hey, Curtis, there you go. There's a modeler. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the reality, as is put in that sticky, is that, you know, the, you know, satellite broadcast network and NOAA is saturated. Right. Uh, we're looking at pushing toward, you know, ever increasing resolution modeling systems over larger domains. And there's an ensemble component to this for uncertainty information. So then you have another multiplier in terms of the volume of data that needs to get either moved around or accessed somehow. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to have a comprehensive strategy on how we're going to move forward with this ever increasing volume of NWP data amongst other things, because it's some of it's just not going to be, I think, uh, distributable any longer under under the, over the conventional uh, data feeds. So, um, you know, we, we, there's got to be a, a path forward that we can work on to make sure the data gets to where it needs to be in whatever form that may take. So there's a lot of, you know, emerging technologies that might help with this problem. Um, obviously, cloud resources is something that's being continually pushed forward um, for leveraging uh, data that you don't necessarily even have to move. Uh, you can have access to it there. Um, so again, I think it's just a broad topic of uh, discussion, but something we really have to think about yeah, and do we have to use satellite broadcast like NOAA port? When I worked in private industry, we had AWIPS at our facility. We did have SBN, but some of the higher resolution things and whatnot, we got via the internet. So th they came on landline rather than going by satellite. So maybe that's a way you put it out there on a cloud and people that want the grids and they have the bandwidth, they can come and get it. It would be a, a, a possible way to solve that, I guess. Randy, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, you know, I was, I was hoping the uh, uh, Sally McFarlane or or one of the DOE folks was on on here today. Um, they dealt with that issue with the PBL um, over the last eight or 10 years or maybe more uh, dealing with uh, renewable energy with uh, you know, wind farms and uh, uh, solar panels and, and things like that. Um, you know, I know that you know, each one of those has basically their own little weather sensor now and um, that to, uh, to help with. You know, our our problem is bigger with with UAS because we're not a you know a single site location uh, spread out. We're you know our our sensors are going to be moving or the the platforms we need to support are going to be moving. But uh, you know, there there's got to be some uh, you know lessons learned from them that that maybe we can do. Um, I, I completely agree with Matthias um, and his comment. Um, I don't think we need that ultra fine 
uh, resolution everywhere. Um, and, and that's both horizontal and vertical uh, on that. Um, you know, and, and maybe in, maybe in the inner cities, maybe you do need a, you know, a 10 meter resolution, maybe in the rural areas, you know, 100 meters or 300 or something. Um, and you certainly don't need that at 35,000 feet. So, um, but how to break that down and depend and decide, you know, where you need it and, and uh, when you need it is the, uh, is going to be a difficult nut to crack. Good points. Thanks. Uh, Gordy, I see you have your hand up. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bill. Well, with, re with regard to um, the use of this stuff and kind of acceptance of this stuff or, or to allow third parties to develop this stuff, in my mind, it still sits around this idea of acceptable standards. How good does the information have to be? Um, and then we kind of turn it loose, turn them loose because you know, what I heard in the past couple of days is there's a lot of amazing things going on, um, you know, with development of uh, weather information that's significantly useful to the uh, UAS AAM world. Um, yet we we still struggle with this kind of regulatory, you know, um, burden that we're, start, that we're stuck with. And, and I think that's up to us as a group here to develop these these standards and you know for the weather elements that are necessary for operations and 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 we go from there and that that kind of opens the door for you know whoever wants to play in this world or whatever information is available out there in the federal government that can be um, coordinated and utilized to uh, to be useful for the operators because certainly we're not going to have the operators build this stuff. It's going to be um, it's going to be the folks on this call and and uh, the third party folks that are listening in. Thanks, Gordy. Um, Gary, before I get to you, I wanted to ask a question on the DOD side on dissemination. I guess uh, Colonel Williams, I know you're on. Um, if you can address how Air Force weather is moving around large amounts of data, um, obviously with NOAA, with uh, um, NOAA port, they're saturated. Um, can you talk to this group about how Air Force Weather does that with all the model data and whatnot? Nope, not hearing anything from Colonel Williams. I see you're lit up, but I don't hear anything. Okay, um, I, Gary, I guess we'll go to you. Your hands up. Yeah, mine will be really quick. It actually follows up a little to Gordy and it's kind of to Gordy. I keep seeing the stuff, you know, with resolutions and things. One thing that I haven't seen anybody brief and I may have missed it. I haven't been there, especially at AAM. Right now, weather is consumed at some way, however much it's processed, whatever resolution for decisions, for a decision. That information goes to somebody somewhere who makes a decision. When you hit AAM, it's now automation, which means that in, the weather information is now changing from just advisory and a person decides what they want to do to actually driving a critical decision. It's going to suddenly become go, no go data. And I haven't heard how anybody is changing the criticality of that information that's being produced or how they're going to verify the integrity of that information to make go no decisions in like AAM, where all of a sudden you don't have a person who analyzes all the available data and says, here's where I'm going to go. Is that being addressed anywhere? That would fall under Gordy and the kinds yeah, of standards. Is that being done, how you're going to use weather for the criticality? No, and that's, that is a huge, huge critical piece that you're, that you're referencing. That to me if seems you, to be completely missed for anything yeah. where people want to go. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, if you go back to regulation, the pilot has to have the dispatcher, the latest available information to conduct an instrument approach, can't pass the final approach fix unless you have bang, bang, bang. Right. So there's, there's, there are certain, there are certain, you know, fail safes that have been put into the system and we're a bloodborne agency. I'm sorry, that's what we are. And the reason these regulations were written this way is because of accidents in the past. We don't need to recreate that with, with AAM. So those decision points, someone, something has to make the decision right and the yeah. information that based on the uh, you know based on the mission uh is going to determine how fast the information needs to get there and 
I think Colonel Williams was kind of talking about some of that speed the other day of getting that information to the you know, the battlefield or wherever. Um, but right now, weather doesn't even disseminate quality rating spreads or things like that for automation to even use it. It's really up to the human to make those assessments of who I trust, what I trust. So that's why I said to me, the information and the automation, there's zero done right now in that area. Whether and it, Where do you get a redundant system? Like in flight controls, I can use different dissimilar servos. And if they don't agree, I say abort it and I don't make the decision. Whether it's harder to do that. Right. Right, right, and and you got to be always concerned about uh, analysis paralysis, information overload too. Right. Um, so I mean, it's it certainly some somebody's got to model this, uh, you know, some way, shape, or form model this. What information? What's the minimum information you're going to need? Because we in flight standards, we're the kind of going to be the ones trying to figure out if this is acceptable or not. And and without these standards, boy, it's going to be hard to do this. Yeah, and this is the one, Bill, this is, Bill, the briefing I sent you and that I've been talking to Kevin about to try to start helping flight standards in this area. Right. Okay, um, I saw that I think Matt had put the uh, agenda up there. Maybe he's wanting us to uh, wrap up here, but I do want to let Colonel Williams have a shot. And uh, even though I'm retired Air Force, Dave McCarran, my friend at the Navy, had his hand up, and we'll let Dave speak after Colonel Williams. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, pardon the background noise. I'm in the office today, but uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I don't have a solid answer for you, but uh, I think the way we're getting after the data is is moving to the cloud and then using AI to do some of that. But on the other hand, you know, we have a recognized issue of we've got too much data and, you know, you go to most of our bases, I think Rob Branham said it today, or maybe uh, Captain Cox, you know, we're the, you know, on any base where we have a weather presence, we're the largest user of bandwidth and, and we've got to yeah. clean some of that up. So, um, I think it's a twofold process. One, let's identify what we have and uh, let's let's streamline it a little bit and then let's get it into the cloud and uh, try to make more sense of it through AI. Um, hopefully that adds a little bit to the conversation. Over. Yep, AI makes sense also. All right, thank you. Uh, Dave McCarron, did you want to have a comment here? Yeah, so I'm, I'm just a little different than our Air Force colleagues because they can plug in when they go to an airstrip and <laughs> and connect to get data feeds. We can't do that. Uh, and our our airfields move around. Um, so we've we have had a long history of operating with low bandwidth data. And uh, we still have a human in the loop um, for, for making decisions and making those forecasts, including for unmanned systems as well. We still have a human in the loop for weather and weather planning for them. Um, but we are now bringing back more and more data so we can bring back radar data from battle groups of, uh, afloat and incorporate that into our global model so we are getting more data and more bandwidth um but we don't use near the bandwidth that the rest of you use to do that to exchange those data sources so um, there are ways of doing it um you may need less than this less of a slice of the world than you think you need and that's one of the ways of cutting it so um, okay, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. And, and yeah, we did that um, through our Romeo project um, that was led by Eldridge Fraser and done by NCAR, where uh, over the open ocean, sending um, data up to the, the aircraft, of course, you, you have limited bandwidth. So instead of sending everything, you send the basic of what they need, which would be the contours. And then on the um, aircraft side, on a tablet, you fill in with shading and colors and do all the other processing there instead of trying to do it through bandwidth. So, um, uh, Matt, Bill, uh, I, I was not, uh, it was not a hint. It was, it's where it came up on my screen and then I moved <laughs> it over to the other side. I was just trying to keep track of the time just a little bit. You're fine. And from, from where I sit, you know, this, this gaps area of the hour and a half that we've carved out for these first two sessions is the big gorilla so so if if you're if you still got energy behind the conversations please continue on okay yeah i think we do um you know gordon brooks i see um was talking about the end user needs that was one of the items on here uh why don't we jump to that and and talk about that a little bit because that's so important and that's one of the things we've been doing through our community of interest is getting the stakeholders to tell us what their problems are and uh, I lived in that world for years in the Air Force and also in private industry through tech transition. You've got to know what the stakeholder needs. 
Uh, I'll open it to Gordon if you want to uh, add any comments to that besides what you had in the chat. Or anybody on the panel want to talk about user needs instead of versus the producers. Hi, this is Gordon. Um, hey, Gordon. I was just looking for my notes from yesterday too, but to just to even identify BVOT uh, ex explicitly, but um, it was very interesting. Uh, it was very parallel to what some efforts we've been doing. We call it the stakeholder engagement team, and uh, we're really trying to get down to uh, the users, what they what they need, and especially uh, in this case, uh, this this go around um, the impacts of weather and uh, and the and the forecasts and get, having better forecasts. And uh, so along those lines, um, it was very interesting to listen to, uh, about the BVOT stuff being tested at a few, um, I should say it's tested, but it's also, it's a process. It's a uh, getting out with their, all their EM users and, and this and that, and trying to understand what they need. They were looking at needs and they were, and the whole process here is to, Get it documented for because of continuous turnover, uh, you know, uh, increased turnover that's uh, coming down the road, and uh, and and get the, these things done for for particular stations. I guess it, it's you know another an analogy to this would be like sort of like forecaster ref, forecast reference notebooks that the Air Force has at the various uh, sites. So I'll, I'll say over at this point. And I think one of the things you hit on, Gordon, is the impact when we're getting uh, working on problem statements within our community of interest. Um, we don't want the problem statement to be the pirate process is broken. We want the problem, the issue, and the impact. And you mentioned impact, Gordon. So I think that's really important for the end user not to just say pirates are broken, but to really get down to the details and say, I'm unable to transmit a PIREP because of so-and-so or, what, or whatever the system is, and it causes this impact. That's something that we can work on more. And that's what we look for from the end users is not just to throw something out there and say, this doesn't work for me, but what's the impact? What, how much money does it cost? What does it cost for efficiency? What is it for safety? And when we have that type of input from the end user, it's much easier to justify to the folks that control the dollars. Here's why I need your money to help us work this project because this is the impact that the problem is having. So understanding the needs of the users, I think is really important. On the other hand, for our folks that are in the um, research community, one of the things we've also done within our community of interest is had our FFRDCs come in and brief us on the work they're doing. So we had um, Lincoln Lab and, and NCAR, even NASA, uh, MITRE, say, hey, look at what we're doing. We may have a solution to a problem you know you don't have and make sure that fits. So we get it both ways. We get it from the end user and from the producer or the research side of it. Anybody else have comments on that? Anybody on the panel want to address end user and requirements? Okay, uh, let's see, what else can we pick on here? Probabilistic weather info, well, that's a great topic. Effective use of NWP ensemble spread information for forecast uncertainty and probabilities. Uh, I'm not sure who, who posted that. Uh, certainly one of the things we've struggled with in the FAA with our users, which are mainly the controllers, is they want to know yes or no. Can I turn my airport or not? Is there going to be turbulence or not? And we're trying to help them understand uncertainty and probability to make a decision. Comments? So, uh, Bill, this is Curtis again. I'm, oh, yeah, Curtis, go ahead. I, I put that sticky there. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I think that's, I know we've been talking about this, you know, for some time uh, and the Weather Service and I know the FAA are both trying to figure out a path forward for 
how to, you know, like you said, effectively start using um, and, and leveraging ensemble information that forms the basis for probabilistic forecasts. So, and I completely understand that in the end, you got to make a yes, no decision. Um, but I think, you know, we need to figure out ways to complement um, what would otherwise be a yes, no deterministic forecast from the models with some amount of uncertainty information so that you can at least from a user and stakeholder uh, decision maker standpoint, you know, have a decision that you've made, but you at least have some knowledge about what the un underlying uncertainties were. And maybe you have actionable thresholds based on certain values of those probabilities that makes that probabilistic forecast turn into a yes, no decision. But that type of conversation, education, you know, training, as well as our underlying development of the ensemble systems uh, needs to be, I guess, you know, a, a lot more discussion and collaboration uh, clearly needs to happen on that front to really start to embrace an ensemble probabilistic component to, again, what I know is still underlying deterministic decision making. Yeah, and if you can put that into some sort of decision support tool for the non-meteorologist, the end user, whether that be a, a controller or somebody in, in emergency management, where they don't necessarily know that they're getting probabilities, but the tool provides that for them. And uh, uh, Matt Franzek and his folks at MITRE did a project for us for turning an airport, a terminal winds forecast tool, where the potential tool that we could have created from that, which we haven't done yet, works on probabilities from the forecast and climatology, but the end user really doesn't know that. They see a red, green, and blue for crosswind, headwind, tailwind, and, and what runway they might need to turn to in the next two to four hours or whatnot. And I know Lincoln has done some work uh, in that realm. Um, let me ask if there's any of the folks on here on the private industry side that have worked with the uncertainty and probabilities for their customers, because I'm pretty familiar with FAA and, and weather service, but anybody um, in private industry that's dealt with that? Maybe not, not hearing from anybody. So is Lieutenant Colonel Williams from the DOD side. Yes, um, sir. Something that I was looking at and we were looking at it during my OWS time, you know, when you've got limited manpower and um, lots of things to get done in a day, uh, we kind of gave our airmen a um, sort of a decision support tool and saying, hey, if the weather's really nice out, then automate that task. And I know that's something that I think that's something the National Weather Service kind of does a little more comfortably than we've done in the past. Um, but then we say, hey, if if the weather's starting to get a little sketchy and you're not sure what's going to happen or have less confidence, um, then start to add more of that human in the loop and, and make that a sliding scale, if you will. And then the other thing I've seen done on the UAS side is uh, an example out of uh, somewhere up in New York, I think. Without getting into a lot of detail, there's a lot of layers of decision making that can occur with our unmanned systems. and um, instead of getting too caught up in that, just adding, it was as simple as adding a smiley face or frowny face or just a neutral face to the forecast and saying, hey, this is our confidence in what we got from somewhere else. Boss, non-weather guy, you go make a decision off how comfortable you are with that information. Over. Yep, definitely makes sense. Um, I, I worked in the launch industry for a while and the, the weather squadrons, both at Vandenberg, the 30th and the 45th at the Cape and up at, uh, at Wallops, as uh, Kristen was talking about yesterday, uh, weather puts out a go-no-go no go decision for uh, the launch weather commit criteria that we had discussed. Um, they work on probabilities, but ultimately it's a binary go-no-go no go, uh, based on that criteria. And I see, Curtis, you were alluding to that in, in your chat mm -hmm. message there, the criteria and the thresholds. And in that terminal winds tool, um, the threshold was based on each individual airport. So you had to put that in there uh, uh, based on the different climatology and also the runway configurations for those thresholds. Anybody else on this topic? Okay, um, safety. We haven't talked about that specifically, but um, we have VFR into IMC accidents continue to happen. And I know um, that's really a GA issue. It really could be a UAS issue too. Um, when we go beyond visual line of sight, you're cruising along VFR and your uh, drone gets into trouble 
into freezing fog or, or something like that. Anybody want to bring more to that topic? Anybody on the panel or anybody in the audience or whoever submitted that? Yeah, and this is Randy. I would I would say that it's it's more than just VFR into IMC because uh, we've been seeing a lot of icing uh, accidents in the last couple of years. Um, and then, of course, there's probably still some flying into convection. So I, I, I think it's you know just bigger than just VFR and IMC, even though that may be the, the main one. Um, so it's probably just bigger than than that. Yep, I think you're right. Good point. It, uh, but uh, but I'd like to link this to a comment that that uh, Gary made just a little bit ago about safe uh, about weather information and its its criticality rating um it it you know not not all weather information should or or could be considered safety critical but but right now as best i understand all or almost all i, I think there are some some uh, exceptions having to do with TBFM and TFMS, but but almost all weather information is considered essential, which in the in the criticality hierarchy is like the third level down. Well that that enables us that, that enables systems to um, uh, to have lower levels of availability and and you know uh, latent longer latency and and more downtime than safety critical information but but some weather information i would argue is either directly or indirectly safety critical and i and i think there's a there's a there there's some work that needs to be done in that area to get that squared away so we can figure out what information we can safely and effectively move to the cloud or to off premises type storage and off premises processing and take advantage of some of the things that that, that, that the cloud um, provides without degrading any inadvertently degrading any any uh, um, any of the safety involved with the information. I'm not sure any weather is truly safety critical. That's why you otherwise you'd put it right in a flight management system right now and it would tell you just go here. You could do that. You could have done that years ago. But the weather information and its integrity and the ability to for an FMS to verify it to say just fly here without pilot intervention isn't sufficient. I don't think the weather information has been proven to that level of integrity to enable a flight management system or something comparable to actually do the go no go. It's I, I thought all weather is considered advisory and pilots take use of all that information and then they make a decision based on all of it. So you're right, it is considered essential, but I don't think anything is deemed as safety critical in the sense of meeting in a, a safety criticality level like you do in software or hardware where it's been confirmed to that level. And, and, and as best I understand, Gary, that's correct, but there is some weather information that is um, labeled efficiency critical which is the, the 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 level between the safety critical and the essential and and um but, but i believe you're correct that, that no and that's really what i was bringing up with gordy and i just sent him a briefing and an email and there's two sides to that which i've talked to bill is not only is it a matter of bringing the weather up but then the automation you have to know what the decisions it's making are to know what the whether or not the weather input is at the level of tolerance and integrity to, to support the criticality of the decision making and you need monitors in the transparency and have to understand it that those monitors are compatible with what weather's putting out so if i put out a spread to convey the accuracy of the weather information my automation has to be able to use that spread to evaluate the audit to evaluate that the data is good enough to use to make my decision you don't have that coordination going on either and to my i've done a little homework Nobody has told me they're doing that research yet. Okay, thanks, Matt. So I thanks, don't know, Gordy. Yeah, I figured Gordy, Gordy may have some more comments on this because this is flight standards I've got to work with on. Yeah, it. Go ahead, so I, I do have a few comments. Shocking. I, I thought you might. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm going to actually um, call on Don Ike here in a second. So, uh, Don, Don, if you're if you're listening, I'm, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. But you know, this is this is an interesting discussion, and it's because there's a there's a lot of weather information out there. And and uh, Gary, you're right. I mean, a lot of the information, you know, you build your mental picture uh, of of what the weather is going to be like and what the impact to you and your airplane and and your passengers or whatever, you know, based on your capability and 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 your limitations right the the limitations of the vehicle you're flying so uh, quite often though uh the ntsb has you know picked on us a little bit because they said hey you know there's information over there that this pilot didn't look at and the information was provided and we've done a really good job uh as as a safety organization in raising awareness of lack of information and coming up with a new product um, to fill a gap, yet it overlaps with three or four other products that are still out there. So the pilot, you know, uh, may not have looked at that or may have glossed over that or may have just, it, it might not have been provided to him or her in the first place. So you, tra- you, you, you bring that philosophy into the UAS world here uh, and that there, there is going to be someone responsible for operational control of the vehicle, right? There's, there's, there's going to be an organization that is going to be held accountable. Um, you know, right now in the big air iron world, it's the pilot and the dispatcher. And when the airplane's aloft, it's the pilot in command. Um, and and he or she has those decision-making tools. So I guess I'd just like to hear from, from Don as far as what's his philosophy on this, because this is, uh, we're, we're going to be faced with this. We're going to be faced with a vehicle did something and it hurt someone or killed someone. And, you know, they or didn't look at certain information. And and I think we should be doing the research now to try to figure out what is that information. There you go, Don. You're up. Well, kind of, it, it opens the door. Like, what what is the issue? Is it an icing event? Is it a turbulence event? Um, is it, uh, you know, the, the forecasted conditions uh, at the destination? Um, you know, we have We have so many products out there and for like for briefing purposes um, where we see errors, um, you know, pilots only look may look at the METAR and TAF, not look at the entire in route section, may not look at the adverse weather advisories, um, may not look at PIREPS. And there's there's critical information that all those products provide that we expect that you know certain things are kind of followed uh, to get your briefing get your information it'd be great if we can provide it all in one source and uh and and that's what we look at for uh, pilot briefing areas such as what Lido's or flight service station provides what for flight provides um you just can't go to the aviation weather service and get a briefing because they don't include notums Right. Um, they should have a link to it, but it doesn't include that. Um, I see some weather sites like their weather underground is being brought up as uh, in the AOPA study that, uh, oh, people are using weather un- underground for their data source. Well, do they provide PIREPS? Do they provide the in-flight advisories? Do they provide the graphic area uh, uh, forecast for aviation for the in route portion? Those are all things that we need to do. Uh, and make sure that they look at it. If if we're going to have all these products, um, are they being used effectively? Right. Uh, airline carriers, um, Part 121, the dispatcher is the key key element there, and the pilot will get the uh, basically a weather document or summary of the uh, the conditions, destination, um, alternate and in, in route stations. But he, the dispatchers, the eyes and the ears watching the adverse weather conditions, the turbulence. GA, there is no one like that. Part 135, there, there is no one there to keeping an eye on him. So it all depends on the scenario and what we're giving him and what he needs. Um, but if I'm talking about a, a Cessna 172 or a Mooney or uh, a Cirrus 22 and I'm flying personal, from point A to B and it's winter time, I'm gonna be looking at icing. I'm gonna be looking at pilot reports. I'm gonna be looking at satellite imagery and so forth. Uh, if it's a summer day, I'm not gonna to be too concerned with icing, um, but it all depends on the circumstances you're bringing into the operation. Right. Depends on the mission. So I, I guess we could probably break that down with a lot of these hazards. 
and and be looking at minimum standards or 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 minimum minimum standards for the data. What how how good the data has to be, uh, and use what Gary's done in the WIDIC program to this, to kind of tease out a little bit. You know what information is needed at what point in time. Uh, you know for the for those person to make those operational decisions or or whether it's automated. Maybe the system yeah. can do it. I think one of my counterparts, Paul Suffern, may have a qu uh, input here too. Yeah, yeah, Paul, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, no. One of the things I was going to add on to what Don was saying there, and Gordy and and uh, others have spoke to, um, is making sure that that data is archived, because um, a lot of our our accidents, um, making sure that data is archived, or there's some sign some kind of requirement for graphical data to be archived. I mean, we totally understand that a picture is worth a thousand words and things like that, and, and that is that is awesome. But making sure that there's a requirement or something like that, whether it's the FAA or the Weather Service or other entities, that that graphical information is archived, that's very valuable because, you know, I, I think somebody spoke about earlier, you know, the accident cases is, is where, you know, a lot of times it takes things like that to, to get movement in certain areas. You know, there are other areas that are completely uh, valuable, like surveys, um, AOPA survey and things like that. Um, but if data is not archived or there's not, you know, the same group of pilots is asked the same set of questions, you know, two years down the road, now they're all using Windy instead of four flight, you know, they're all using, if we can establish those trends and those things, that'll help m make better decisions, um, you know, down the road as far as, you know, what product is really essential and what product is not. And you can, can base certain decisions and, and funding, I would assume, and other things based on that. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Gordy, I'll let you have the last word before. Okay. We move on. Yeah. In in support of all that, I guess you know these operators need to need to follow a safety risk safety risk management model, and and they should always be looking at operational improvements. And to do that, they have to, like someone was saying, get the get this get the incidents, um, you know, the incidents that occurred or the events that occurred, analyze it, look at whether the information, the weather information, was appropriate uh, and, and improve. And if it's not, then, they, then there needs to be some level of uh, industry data sharing. Uh, but I, I, I think that that's a, a tremendous piece of, of fixing this is to be able to have continuous improvement. Okay, thanks, Gordy. Um, I thought we'd like to do is move on to one last topic here, which is actually a segue into our, our next session. We went over here, but Matt and I decided we could kind of um, merge these together if need be. We thought there'd be a lot of discussion on gaps. So uh, duplication of effort is uh, the next area we were going to move into that Matt was going to cover. But we have a gap listed here, and I'm not sure it's a gap, but it'll take us into that. It says duplicative convective forecast MRMS and COSPA. So that's a kind of a rock'em sock'em robot issue. Um, which do we use? Do we use both? Why are we using both? So um, I'll go ahead and open that up to any discussion on the duplication we have between those two capabilities. And then Matt, if it's okay with you, we'll move into the next session on duplication. Yeah, that's fine. And, and the, the reason I didn't put a title over that one is because I thought it belonged in this session and not in, not in yours. So uh, that, that's a good segue. Uh, alas, uh, and I, I can see the authoress has her hand up. At least I would guess so. Um, alas, the um, um, the way that I set up these uh, mural sessions, it's going to require a a re-entry for each of the sessions. During lunch, I'll try to fix that for the last two so that it's it's all on one. But for this one, you'll need to go back into mural with the link that I just put in the chat. I hope it's there. It's not there yet. Okay. My my uh, my. There we go. Uh, you'll you'll need to go in and use this one and become a new animal. So so please, if you will, jump in here, and we've got about 20 25 minutes to talk about duplication of effort. And if you still have some gaps that you didn't get to enter into mural, um, please put them in the chat, 
And uh, one of the things I promise we will do from an FAA perspective, and uh, I think Dave can agree from a federal agency, from FPAW, we will take everything that you all are inputting and consider them for um, us to work on. I know from years ago, complaints about FPAW, Ben, we meet, we talk about stuff, and then we come back six months later and meet and talk about the same stuff. But this gives us a really good opportunity to capture a lot of the issues people are thinking about and something that we can bring up through the federal agencies and possibly address and put them into our different processes, including the weather COI and ICAMs across the federal government. So I'll shut up now and uh, turn it over to Heather and then Matt, you can take it from here if you would, sir. Roger that. Um, yeah, I'm not the one that wrote that comment. I'm not sure who did, but um, I think I can put it to bed pretty handily. MRMS does not do what um, COSPA does. Um, we don't have anything that provides that kind of a forecast or outlook. We do have something in there called the Auto Now Caster. That was a requirement by MDL that we would support that. And I'm not sure who within the National Weather Service uses the Auto Now Caster. And there's one other thing in there that's sort of a, an outlook. It's called Prob Severe. Um, that's an outlook of probability of tornadoes, winds, and hail. Um, that's also a National Weather Service requirement. Both of those are a one-hour outlook. So in terms of the capabilities of COSPA, we're not we're not duplicating that at all. Um, they and we have no interest. I think that what Lincoln Labs has devised is very good. So uh, there's there's no duplication there. And and thank you, Heather. And and you know there were two people I would have tagged for having put that comment uh, in there. And uh, and I would have you would have incorrectly been one of them. And I think the other has his hand up right now. Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So um, unless something has changed uh, recently, it's my understanding that uh, MRMS uh, does produce a convective forecast and that it's used by aviation forecasters. Um, I think it's, it, it's used at AWC uh, by their forecasters and uh, for Bruce, I think what you're thinking of is the Auto Now caster. And the last time I spoke with the AWC about that, they thought maybe some forecasters might look at it once in a while, but they weren't really sure anybody was using that. So I'm not sure who in the National Weather Service is using it, but it's the Auto Now caster. It's a rendition of code that was developed at NCAR um, some time ago. They uh, MDL took it over and uh, did some test bed at AWC with it and the in the test bed it seemed favorably reviewed and so um, on the basis of that they had it put into MRMS but I'm not aware that any forecasters at the Aviation Weather Center are using the auto now caster I think they've mostly sh switched over to using the lamp model by now so they're yes. not they're not using um are they using COSPA I couldn't some, use that I don't know are. Bruce, I'll jump in here. This is Brian. Um, I was at the AWC up until a few months ago, and I, I'll double back on what Heather said. There is very limited use on the Auto Now Caster tool. It's undergone a number of iterations that I think uh, ultimately perhaps might have degraded it a little bit. Um, and so, so many changes made it hard for the forecasters to use. Some of our uh, forecasters on what was the CCFP, I guess it's the uh, um, CCFP. Yes. Um, some of our convective forecasters do, we do maintain an account with COSPA and they do use it. Um, and I would be remiss to say they probably mention it in chat several times as they do use it. So they, we do do use COSPA through an online portal in some instances. All right. Well, um, it would, I guess uh, it would seem to me that in the interest of sort of all speaking, uh, from the same page that uh, everybody who's doing aviation convective forecasting ought to be, if, if COSPA is, is our lingua franca, uh, everybody ought to be looking at COSPA and speaking uh, from COSPA, whether they're in the weather service or whether they're in the FAA. So anyway, um, if, if I incorrectly characterized the issue, I, I will withdraw it, but 
Um, but I do think that having us all speaking from a common uh, forecasting uh, viewpoint uh, is where we ought to be uh, with aviation. Hey, Bruce, it's Kevin. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I remember those discussions more than 15 years ago when, you know, the vision of COSPA was was presented. And again, the complaint from many users that there's too many convective products and we haven't addressed that, right? So, but under WIMAT, uh, this weather information modernization and but what's the T stand for, Matt? You should know this. We 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 use YMAT, you know. <laughs> I was hoping you. you wouldn't ask but me. I, I don't know. Transition. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that's that's the next effort, Bruce, to to look at the whole suite of convective products, move towards that vision of uh, you know using that gridded output of COSPA. And if you need you need to look at some other type of product, you know, if we need to have some kind of SIGMET in the future, you know, derive it off of that. But, um, you know, so that, yeah, we're going to start that up here real soon. And when you say that, that includes not just FAA, uh, but includes weather service. Uh, Correct. Correct. Users. Correct. You know, we're, we're, you know, internally looking at FAA, you know, we invested a lot of money in that, uh, you know, COSPA and, you know, we're looking at feeding that output to the various systems that need the convective information. So that, that's one part of the consistency, right? But yes, look at the legacy suite of products that we've got. And we're looking at uh, working with the weather service if they need the coast. Well, what do they need from us that we do, you know, produce uh, through SWIM? And I'm sure the convective output that we've got within the FAA will be part of that dissemination to the weather service. Thank you. It's it's taken a long time, but we're we're gonna we're gonna take it on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. So thank you, Bruce. And and Bruce, welcome. Uh, this is I think the first time I've heard you uh, speak during these four days. So it's good to hear your voice and see your face on the other end of the camera. Well, you guys are doing such a good job. I couldn't think of anything I needed to say. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, so uh, we do have two folks with hands up, but uh, before I go to Matthias next, I want to encourage folks to go to the uh, group brainstorm page and add to the so far one comment that has been made, uh, um, and uh, it's a good one. I, I will I will admit up front that of of all the topic areas, uh, at least based on what I heard over the last three days, I, I didn't. I didn't necessarily walk away thinking that there were egregious examples of, of, of you know, duplication of effort that could could easily be resolved uh, or, or that should be immediately taken on. So I'm not shocked. And, and I guess on one level, I'm I'm kind of happy that there's right now only one sticky up on the wall, but surely there are others. So put your put your thinking caps on folks put some uh, put some notes in here so we can uh, so we can explore this just a little bit okay matthias over to you i want to just add an observation going back to mrms and cospa or series for that matter mrms is assimilated into the her as part of the data assimilation and curtis maybe you correct me if i'm wrong about that and then COSBA is blending the HER with the CIRIS. And so in many ways, we actually have it already mingled there uh, using both in there. So it's just an interesting observation, I think. Yeah, Matthias, that's correct. Uh, we do assimilate the MRMS radar observations into the HER, and then that's an input into COSBA. Huh. Interesting. Randy Bass. Yeah, I was actually going to uh, make a similar observation um, and comment that uh, Matthias did. But upon a care clarification, just remember, um, you know, MRMS is that uh, analysis tool, whereas COSPA is technically a forecast. So there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are differences there. Um, but the main point is I wanted to make, you know, MRMS, or let's let's start with uh, with CWIS. CWIS has it, it was tailor made for aviation. 
MRMS has three masters. It has aviation, but it also has severe and hydro that they have to conform to. So one of the big differences um, between the two is, um, you know, CWIS can be kind of tuned towards aviation. So if you miss a little bit of that, uh, you know, uh, light precip, it's not going to matter. Um, but for hydro and severe, that's huge. So it can't, you know, do that. So there are differences in it. Um, but one of the other things is, uh, CWIS doesn't really have a 3D component that uh, M MRMS does. So we can do, you know, the, the uh, hydrometeor classifications from uh, MRMS that you can't get out of, out of CWIS. So there are a lot of differences, um, and, and I think there's uh, plenty of room on the aviation side for, uh, for both of them. Um, uh, Kim, uh, hang on one second. I want to I wanna follow on to to what Randy just said and and asked philosophically, and this was something that I I threw out as a as a conversation starter yesterday or the day before or the day before I don't remember now. Um, um, you know, you, by, by saying what you've said, Randy, I, I think that that you're suggesting that 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 th there is th there is room in the in the um, in the arsenal of weather products that that we produce at a federal level for products that are specialized or tuned for areas that require those specialized products, and, and, and as opposed to a one size fits all solution for everybody, is that is that a fair statement? Yeah. Um, now that being said, um, you can make a case that you know. Coastball should still be run by the Weather Service because it is a forecast, but I'm not going to, I, I will just throw that bomb out there, but then stay away from it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kim, uh, you disappeared off my screen. Hopefully we haven't stolen all your thunder. <laughs> no, here I am. Sorry, I, I lowered my hand while I was waiting. Um, I just wanted to um, mention, uh, since we were on this topic with, with COSPA uh, forecast and HER and MRMS, um, uh, Lincoln is currently doing a little study for some cases this summer uh, that we've noticed. We actually had a few users from Minneapolis Center and um, our own internal uh, analysis that has showed that um, the COSPA forecast performance on several occasions this summer has been under forecasting quite a bit, and we're looking to uh, explore some of the, um, the HER um, analysis to kind of see what changes may, may be impacting that. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't know. I, I missed some of the conversations the past couple of days, um, and so we'll be following up with... Um, Perhaps you know the folks at NCAR where we do the blending with and um, with some slides and also reaching out to the her folks um, about this. But I was curious if any others had um, noticed that or, or had been pointed, you know, pointed in that direction for any um, forecast biases with with COSPA this season. Anybody in the audience have some feedback for Kim on COSPA forecast bias? I will take silence to mean no, not really. <laughs> okay, well, we'll be following up with with some um, analysis results and, and see what we find. But um, it, you know, there have been uh, quite a few cases this summer that that we're concerned about. So uh, we may need to kind of look back and see impacts based on her changes and things like that, that that would be impacting. We've also noticed it in some of the NWP test reference forecasts as well. Very good. Thank you, Kim. And welcome, by the way, your 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 name uh, is a new one to me. I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Thank you. Um, let me go over to the uh, the uh, group brainstorm board where um, where where there is a uh, a comment up there, and I think that we could ask our our panelists from across the uh, the various agencies to comment on. I, I already see that Dave McCarran has a a hand up, uh, and and that, and this uh, this says instead of Weather Service, Air Force, and Navy all running numerical weather prediction models, why can't we have one federal model or suite of models that's run in the cloud that all agencies have access to? 
So, so Matt, I, I should have put my name on it. That came from me, and I will tag it with my name if we need to. And just a little backstory on that. Back in around 1982, when I was a second lieutenant at Air Force Global Weather Center in Omaha, on the hallway there, there was a little display of the different models run by the, the Air Force and Weather Service and Navy. And I was standing there with a major looking at it, and I asked that very question. And his answer to me was, Lieutenant, that's above your pay grade. Don't ask questions like that. <laughs> and I let it go. And I, I've thought about this throughout my career and, and uh, asked the question several years later. And the answer that I got was the missions are different. The National Weather Service mission has certain requirements for their model output, the Air Force for theirs and the Navy theirs, especially when you're considering the ocean component and whatnot. Um, but I've still thought about it all these years. And now with cloud computing, is that a possibility? And about a year or so ago at a FICMISER meeting, Federal Coordinator for Met Services and Supporting Research, I think, it, it, OFCM meeting with, with senior executives. Um, at the time, uh, Ralph Stoffler was Director of Weather, and he said, we're gonna run Galwin in the cloud. Anybody can have access to the fields that wants it and have output for their model. So I was like, huh. Maybe we should bring this up again in some sort of forum. Maybe there's some um, group that I can address that to. So I'm throwing it out there and uh, I'll let Dave take the first shot at me for suggesting such a horrible idea. <laughs> now, Bill, I don't think it's that horrible of an idea, but it's a requirements issue. And uh, you already hit on some of them, but like, you know, the models that we run now, and particularly the weather service model runs particularly well over Kansas where it's got a really good um, field of observations to support it. It doesn't run as well over the Horn of Africa and over the seas of the Horn of Africa where it doesn't have that same observational density and it's, and it's dependent on other things. So, Navy runs our model because we need to operate in places like that. And if you look at our model, it doesn't perform as well over Kansas as, as GF, GFS does or the, the Unified Forecast System does. And as Bill mentioned, one of the things we need, one of the real reasons we run a global atmosphere is because we need to run a global ocean and we want to be the best at ocean modeling in the world because we hide things there not only in the depths of the ocean, but in the near um, surface ocean environment, we have to hide things there as well. And um, we need an atmospheric model that supports our ability to understand and use that environment. Our model's not all about aviation support. It's about a lot of other things. And so um, the, if you were to have one federal system, you ju we just need to make sure that all the requirements are in there and it needs to be able to run in a classified mode for to support um, classified missions so with that um, but i think it's a good idea bill uh, but i don't know how we could ever get there very good thank you dave uh, great comment and bill uh also a, a good and interesting thought-provoking uh, comment too. And then I, I believe it was Matthias who uh, I, I think I saw come in and and kind of stick a sticky underneath the sticky um, that that uh, that that says that hey before we before we go to a single model remember that uh, that, that multi models create ensemble opportunities. Uh, Matthias, was that you? And if so, did, did you want to comment any further about it? Yes, that was me. And uh, in, in many ways, you know, if you have variety in the model course or the way they use that simulation, et cetera, it really captures the uncertainty in the forecast. And if you go down to a single model, you lose that opportunity to to characterize the forecast uncertainty. So actually having multiple cores, multiple models, it's creating opportunities that are beneficial. Matt, as a follow-up to uh, Dave's comment, we did have a question from Heather about uh, using classified data assimilation. Yeah, and I saw Dave's hand up, so I thought he was gonna answer it, but then I thought that he figured that he'd have to shoot us if he did, so. Um... 
<laughs> it says hand not up. <laughs> All right, so I can answer that real quickly. So we do use classified observations in some cases. Uh, remember, all of our ship observations come in as classified because the locations of those ships at a given point in time is classified. Um, but we do use them, but we do not use them in the global model. So uh, our global model is free of that. And as a result, our global model is available to everybody to use as well. Um, so we do use classified observations from a whole variety of sources, um, but not in our global model. Back in the day, and I'm talking you know, 30 plus years ago, so I don't want to speak for Air Force weather today, but classified observations were included in the models and the data assimilation, um, but the global model output was unclassified. And at that time, again, I'm speaking for a long time ago, the theory was that the bad guys couldn't tell where those classified observations were coming from because of everything else that was assimilated in the model the data itself and the data sources were not divulged. So you just got the, the generic model output like mean sea level pressure. So I certainly can't speak to how Galwin is run and, and what uh, classified ops might be part of that, but there was a way to mitigate that, at least back in the day, it was understood that the model output did not divulge any of the classified information. Very good, thank you, Bill. Um, it it seems uh, not surprisingly to me again it it, it seems that we've um, uh, on this notion of duplication of efforts uh, um, we we've, we've run out of things to say uh, we have very few um, sticky notes in the uh, in the brainstorming area and uh, and you know rather than rather than feeling bad about that I think in some ways I feel good about that that, uh, that you know maybe there's not as much duplication of effort um, as one thinks there is given the slightly not slightly given the different missions that that all uh, the users of aviation weather or weather information in general uh, have for it um, and and so um, on that note, According to the agenda, which is here, uh, we have reached our lunch um, uh, uh, brunch, or maybe in Andy's case, late breakfast time period. And uh, so uh, we will take a firm 30 minute break and see you all back at 1.45 p.m. Eastern time, or whatever that is, wherever you are.